It's Entomology Animated, celebrating the amazing biology of insects using the power of digital animation. Ding! Hi, this is Eric for Entomology Animated, continuing on with my project, creating a rainbow scarab beetle, and I'm focusing mostly on the head at the moment. Um, since the previous episode, a lot has changed on this model. I'm going to uh, demonstrate some of my sculpting techniques uh, towards the end, but I want to point out some of the changes that I made. So, if we look at the older version of the model, you can see that this kind of line continues all the way to the back here and then kind of stops. You also notice that the eye is perfectly spherical and there's a bit of a gap right here between these two pieces. And this is kind of thin going down here, or it's, you know, it has kind of a uniform thickness with the edge right here. So those are all things that I've changed based on what I was taking a look at underneath the microscope. So in this case, you can see that the edge kind of ends here right behind the horn. You can also see that the eye is not spherical. It's kind of got this weird potato shape, which is interesting. We still have a part that's popping out at the top and a part that's coming out at the bottom. And we can see that this is not a uniform thickness. We have sort of a thick area right here, and then it kind of tapers down and goes around the edge. Um, so this is all based on what I looked, observed under the microscope. We also have some changes here to the bottom. You can see the, uh, the various mouth parts here. I've kind of moved them around a little bit, and I've repositioned the antenna. So if you look at the reference photos that I took, you can see here's the bottom of the eye. Here's this part of the mouth right here. Uh, a lot of this is covered in fur and it's not easy to see even under the microscope exactly what's going on. So uh, this is what I have in terms of my model is a more accurate guess at what's going on right here than what I had before. But I'm sure that some parts are still a little bit wrong. But you can see there's space here underneath and there's some detail down here. And there's also kind of a pocket right in front of the eye where the antenna fit in. And you can see that we have these rounded sort of um, scoops right here. So if you look at my model, we can see that here's the pocket right in front of the eye where the antenna is coming out. And we also have these segments. And then the end of the antenna is kind of like these rounded cups. So one thing I wanted to point out is that, you know, a lot of times when you're working on insects, you'll see that forms uh, have analogs throughout the body. In other words, the antenna is very similar to the tarsus of the legs. You know, we have sort of more of a triangular shape here, but we still have this kind of idea of um, sort of repeating uh, segments that fit into each other. They're kind of more conical or triangular than the antenna, but it's just still the same kind of idea. So you can almost think of like every limb on an insect, whether it's a leg or an antenna or otherwise, is usually using similar forms. Like everything's a leg in a way. Now, obviously, there's some more exotic forms up here on the front legs. We'll be addressing that in a later episode. So things do kind of change. There are variations, but there's also a rhythm and repeating motifs. So anytime you're doing an insect, whether it's a real one or one you're designing, think of those repeating motifs. Try and keep your insect design down to like four or five different overall sort of rules or forms. You start to mix too many forms together, there is contrast, like if you look at the pronotum and the elytra here, there's definitely contrast there, but at the same time, there's also a lot of repeating motifs. If you start to throw in too many ideas, then your insect design starts to look less and less realistic and a little bit more contrived. So there's a sort of a sweet spot in terms of the number of different forms that you want to focus on. Um, so pay attention to that when you're looking at reference, I guess is the best way to put that. So speaking of looking at reference, let's go back to this. Because um, I wanted to compare this rainbow scarab with another one. So here is our rainbow scarab. Um, and this is some pictures that I took while I was at the bug shop uh, macro photography workshop in Mozambique. So this is an African scarab beetle. And this is our North American scarab beetle. And there's a lot of similarities and there's a lot of differences. There's the biggest difference between these two, literally, is that this guy is alive and crawling around while I'm trying to take his picture. And this one is dead. 
So you can see how the limbs are all kind of shriveled up and close to the body here and all the forms are kind of stuck together. It's kind of desiccated. And we got this disgusting schmutz. Let's see if we can find a version. There we go. No disgusting schmutz on this one. That's a bit better. Um, but you can sort of see that there are a lot of similarities and there are a lot of differences. We can see more rounded forms here, different types of sort of protrusions on the pronotum here. We don't quite have these kind of weird spiky bits, but we do have this kind of look like a Batman wing. And uh, so here it's kind of rounded off. We do have the horn. The horn on the male uh, dung beetles is very important. It's used in terms of, it's sort of a, a result of sexual selection. So longer horns mean that they can duke it out with other males more successfully and win the hearts of the female dung beetles. And the antenna here in this image are folded back. Let me see if I can find one that has the antenna a little bit more forward but they are in sort of the same place. We can't see sort of the bottom here of the beetle. So we do have some similar forms here in the bottom, not exactly the same. We do have the bottom of the eyes is clearly visible here. We do have this part of the mouth and then we have the other mouth parts and a fair amount of hair. So that is definitely similar. So in this version, we can see here the antenna, they're a little bit more forward. So these things were wiggling around a lot while this guy was crawling around. Um, so you can see they're moving, they're kind of out and a little bit more visible. They are similar to the antenna on this one. There's some slight differences in the form. Um, but the biggest difference I think that I wanted to point out is the head itself. You can see how flat it is. There's a smaller part of the eye that's visible here on the top. And it's almost like this flat shovel right here. It's a little bit more triangular, whereas this guy is a bit more rounded in the front. And we have more of a gradual slope coming down it kind of ends right here. And then of course the horn on our African version has this notch in it right here. And this does not have a notch. This particular one has kind of a separation right here, but I think that's just this individual. Some of the other, uh, yeah, so this, this, this one doesn't have any separation there. I think it's just that one that did. But so those are some interesting differences. And to me, I think the upshot here is not so much what's the difference between our American scarab beetle and our African one, but what's similar. Uh, let's take a look at how we can detail or sculpt in some of the detail on the latest version of the rainbow scarab beetle. So what I want to do is I want to sculpt some of the detail that we see here on the horn right here. So this pitting. So I'm going to set this Damien standard brush to Let's do spray. Let's look in the options here. I'm going to increase the placement so they're spread out a little bit. And also I'm going to reduce the scale variation. So scale here, the slider refers to the randomness applied to that. If I just click on here, I get this. That's not what I want. Let's go back a couple steps. Let's lower the draw size. And I'm going to turn this to Z, Z sub and leave it to Z sub click on that that's not what I want at all but it's a little bit closer um, one thing that might help is let's turn off symmetry so I'm not doubling up on my strokes here let's also change the alpha and instead of this sort of gradient I'm gonna pick this little alpha 40 here and see that's getting us a little bit closer it's a bit too strong so let's set the Z intensity down quite a bit that's a little bit better and let's go in here and increase the placement even more. And set the scale variance to zero. Maybe the flow will increase out a little bit. And let's make the Z intensity down to like, let's say three. It's starting to look a little bit better. So we have the basic idea. The problem is, is the placement of each of these little dots here is way too random. If we look at our, our reference, you can see that the pores, you know, they're randomly placed, but there's also somewhat of a regularity to them in terms of the spacing in between. And I'm really just not getting that out of this brush. So let's try a different tactic. Let's go to clay and I'm gonna set this to drag rect. And I'm gonna go into light box and take a look at our alpha. There is one alpha that, that reminds me of what we're seeing here and that's the bumpy skin one. So I'm gonna double click on this. We're double click on it again. There we go. Close light box. Let's undo a few steps. So we'll get back to here. 
Okay, but not quite there. Let's turn it to Z sub. That's a little bit closer. Closer, but uh, still not crazy about it. If you take a look here, again, it's a much more regular. So let's try another tactic. Okay, so after a bit of fooling around with some ideas for brushes, I, I came up with something that I think I like a little bit better. You can see I can just drag out these dots because I do want a, the ability to position them and I want them to be consistent in terms of their style. I set this to drag dot. I did create my own alpha in Photoshop. Pretty simple, just a few dots, a little bit of irregularity, kind of position like that. And what I'm hoping to achieve is something like a placement kind of like that. So it's gotta be imperfect, but also somewhat regular. So it can't be totally random and it can't be totally regular. It has to be something sort of in between in order to look organic. So a couple things I'm gonna do, let me undo these brush strokes. And I'm actually going to save a morph target before I do any brushing. I'll show you why. So I'll go down here to morph target and I'm going to store a morph target. And now I'm going to start to, I'm actually painting with my mouse, um, position these guys and actually go a bit faster if I turn on symmetry for these outer parts. So just draw these bits right here. And symmetry is going to help cut the time down in half. So my goal is to get something regular, but also something that doesn't take forever to sculpt. So add these things, and then for the middle part, I'll turn off symmetry and then position these things. So if you're looking at it, it doesn't, it, you know, it looks random enough, but that symmetry just cuts down a little bit of extra sculpting time. Now the reason that I saved a morph target is because I might want to go in here and clean this up a little bit. Let's say if I do something that's a bit sloppy like that, um, some of these things are a little bit too close together. I can switch over to the morph brush, and the morph brush only works after you've stored a morph target. So store a morph target, then I can go in here with the morph brush, lower the draw size, and literally paint out those dots that I don't like the placement of because it's basically painting back to that stored morph target state. So that means I have a very targeted way of doing an undo in case I don't like the, the uh, placement of my dots. Because I lost my draw size, I think I have it at 92. Yeah, something like that is good. And then of course, it's always a good idea to save the brush just in case, you know, ZBrush crashes or something. I'm just gonna go through and kind of cover the horn with this pattern and then clean up as necessary. So there's just a few ideas on how you can do a specific type of detailing. I'll probably knock this back a little bit with some smoothing too. So if I hold the shift key and I have a low Z intensity on my smooth brush, I kind of smooth it out so they look a little bit less severe. All right, well, thanks for watching this episode and I'm going to continue to do some detailing uh, in the next video before we move on to the other parts of the beetle.